record. Okay. Say, so, Bill Arini, please go ahead. Uh, do we need to wait or we can start? And that was the video introductions for uh, CCLS Queen Mary. Uh, greetings, good day to everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, the present and future of smart cars, law and policy, organized by the Center for Commercial Law Studies, CCLS Queen Mary, University of London, in particular by the Alumni Association from three different countries, Brazil, Indonesia, Italy, and the distance learning CMT chapter. I, Muhammad Iqbal Pratama, from the Indonesian chapter, will be the host of today's webinar event. This webinar shall consist of two sessions among five speakers. The first session shall be started by me and later opened by the moderator, Ms. Ayu Mawarini, followed by the presentations from, three, from two separate speakers. The second session shall then be continued by Ms. Ayu, followed by the respective following three speakers. Each speakers are entitled to 15 to 20 minutes to complete their presentation, whereas Q&A session could be held either after the two speakers have finished with the presentation or raised throughout the whole session in the chat box. I will now proceed by introducing our moderator for this event, Ms. Ayu. Ayu Maurini is an alumna of the School of International Arbitration, Queen Mary University of London, LLM in 2020, specializing in international dispute resolution. Currently, Ayu works as a lawyer at Mahendra & Co. law firm, handling domestic and global clients in corporate business, construction, employment laws, and IPR, IP rights. Moreover, she also handles patents, trademarks, and industrial designs. Ayu also has a particular interest in technological issues, such as cybersecurity, followed by her dissertation, appraising the topic of the duty of ensuring cybersecurity in international commercial arbitration for her master's studies. She is now engaging with a project related to data protection, privacy, and compliance to advise clients about the recent Indonesia data protection laws. Without further ado, 
We will now commence the webinar. Ms. Ayu, the floor is yours. Thank you for the opening and introduction, Iqbal. This is a valuable opportunity for me personally and all of the panelists and participants to gather together for today to discuss in regards to the world's advancement of technology in smart cars. Before we jump to the main discussion, please kindly allow me to express the appreciation statement on behalf of the organizer and steering committee, TCLS Center for Commercial Law Studies, Joint Chapter Event, Brazil, Distance Learning, Indonesia, and Italy. Every people who are contributing for the success of the Smart Cars webinar, especially all the panelists and experts in the field that are willing to allocate their time to share knowledge with us for the greater purpose of contributing all to the social legal profession. Mr. Firdaus, uh, Firdausi Firdaus from University of Barcelona, who are also the initiator and the lead project of this event. We have also Mr. Mahawira Singh Gilad from Transisi Energy Bertaadilan.id, Ms. Valentina Torelli from Grimaldi Studio Legale. We have also Mr. Pedro Duarte Batista from VDA Fiera de Almeida, and we have Nicole Rien Kunha from Bas and Rameh Avocado, Avogados Asia Siados. Special gratitude are also expressed for Ms. Catherine Taylor Bennett and Ms. Rahel Awusudom from the CCLS Alumni and Development Team in London for remotely assisting the technical and promotional preparation for this Smart Cars webinar. We definitely will not be able without the help from the CCLS Alumni and Development Team, so thank you. We also have Mr. Muhammad Iqbal Pratama from the Central Bank of Indonesia as the host of this event, who also, also prepared the e-flyer and Zoom background, who are also my colleague at CCLS Committee Indonesia chapters, along with Mr. Firdausi Firdaus. Appreciation is also given to Ms. Ayumawarini, myself, for promotional assistance, as well as the rest of the members of CCLS Committee Indonesia chapters and CCLS Indonesia Committee. As we all understand that this is the global webinar contributed by professionals from Brazil, Indonesia, and Italy, we express our appreciation to Mr. Casio Moss, Ms. Maya Ranunes, and Ms. Ana Carolina Cagnoni Ribeiro from the CCLS Brazil chapter. Mr. Luca Otiero from the CCLS Italy chapter for the cooperation in finding and approving the speaker for this event and for promoting assistance. Ms. Valentina Torelli from the Distant Learning TMT chapter for her cooperation in particular as speaker of this event. We also would like to thank you for the intention of Ms. Phyllis Pial from SRP Legal to contribute as she was supposed to be the second moderator for this event. However, due to the uh, personal circumstances, she will, uh, she will not be able to contribute to this event. However, uh, we still thank you for uh, her contribution to this event. Last but not least, we also appreciate all of the participants who were kindly enough to allocate their time to be here and those who are not able to attend. However, learning from the distance from this recorded webinar in the next opportunity. We sincerely express our gratitude and welcome all the participants to learn and discuss together with us to enrich the discussion and contributing to our society. In this opportunity, I will be discussing, uh, we will be discussing of smart cars as the advancement of technology that is undeniable and the technology is moving forward to bring the society to the next level of industry, including the transportation. We can all foresee the movement of technology in taking over the conventional mode of transportation to the automatic one, followed with the electric cars, autonomous cars, self-driving cars, and also urban air mobility cars. As part of the legal society, we are urged to be agile in noticing and preventing social legal issues that may arise as the consequences of the transportation advancement in smart cars. The innovation is part of the development and the improvement of human life, but the people's rights shall not be set aside or even forgotten. We are all here to discuss that we are the uh, that we are the history 
and the effect and what might be affecting people's life in legal perspectives. I personally believe that the topic is truly valuable as we will receive the insights from different legal jurisdictions, making us aware of what should be considered in each other's nation, learn from each other and protecting the society in the best way we could provide to increase the society's awareness in embracing smart cars. Thus, on this occasion, CCL's alumni chapters, Brazil, Distance Learning, Indonesia, and Italy, decided to organize the webinar on the topic of the present and future of smart cars law and policy as part of our contribution to the society, in particular to educate and raise awareness people as well as give the recommendation to law and policymakers on what should be improved in handling this car's issue. Without further ado, we will begin the first session. The first session, we will have two speakers and followed with the questions and answers, Q&A. Please prepare your questions in the meantime for all of the participants in the chat box and stating your name and also your institution during the process. The first presentation from our speaker will be coming from Mr. Firdausi Firdaus. Mr. Firdausi Firdaus is an alumni of CCLS Queen Mary University of London with an LLM in Computer and Communication Law, graduating in 2013. Currently, Firdausi Firdaus is a PhD student and researcher in ICT law at the University of Barcelona. Before his PhD studies at UB began, Ferdowsi was a lecturer in ICT, Information Communication and Technology Law modules at UNPAD Indonesia, such as Cyber Law, Media Law, Telecommunication Law, Case Study on Law, and Technology and E-Commerce Law. Ferdowsi was involved in some organization in the ICT area local and global, such as MASTEL, ISOC, and ICTLSA. He was the lead country Queen Mary Universe of London Alumni Ambassador in Indonesia between 2014 and until 2022. Lastly, currently Ferdowsi is co-chair of the CCLS Queen Mary University of London Indonesia chapter. So the first speakers will be having the topic of introduction to smart cars. Mr. Firdausi, the time is yours. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ayu Maurini, uh, for the kind introduction. Thank you for having me, everybody. Uh, okay, before that, can I check whether my screen is already seen? I mean, the slide. Rini, have you seen my screen? Not yet, Mr. Fridelsi. Yeah, wait. It should be share screen, yeah? Okay. Can you see it? Yes, right yes. now. Okay, wait. Yeah, wait, sorry for the being slow here. Oh yeah, this one. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. With further ado, I will start the session. Uh this topic is very much uh probably is the realization of my uh, child, children, my childish uh, wish uh, in the past, especially when I watched the Big Fit uh, film. Well, those were from millennials, probably. Uh, um, I think when we talk about the development of cars, uh, we can refer to one of the American race driver here, uh, Dale Enhart. He was the race driver in America from America between 1975 to uh, it's never ending battle of making your cars better and also trying to be better yourself so car from time to time it's always developed I think it's the same like uh, the beginning of the 
human to always uh, do innovation. Uh, but before we talk about the present and the new future of the cars, we probably should uh, refer back to the history of the cars as we see from the slide. This, this actually can be considered as the first car uh, who used uh, steam power yeah, back then in 17th century. Yeah. So I think if we compare with the shape of car nowadays, it's very much different than uh, what we can imagine, right? This is also the example of uh, electric cars uh, in 19th centuries. Very different than Tesla or uh, Wooling car nowadays. And this is maybe more like what I expected, but this one is still more than 20 years ago. It was in 1997, uh, Toyota RAV4 uh, electric vehicle. Then when we are talking about the uh, history of car, it's very much dominated with internal combustion engines. Yeah, uh, like the one that we see here. Again, this is car at that time. Yeah, it can be it's a car. Uh, and this one is also example of the car we, where I think it's one of the main uh, invention at that time in 1885, especially for internal combustion. Uh, this is the, if we divide the errors, then I will not go detail about this. Um, yeah, so the history of curve uh, based on development technology is something that we probably take for granted nowadays, but it is actually, it will take some time from even when seat belt is uh, invented, 1959, or airbags is invented. Even the connected cars that actually is one of the scope of smart cars, it is already invented in 1996, yeah. Now we go to the present, yes, yeah, smart cars. Uh, smart cars, if we go back to 2000, yeah, year 2000, it, it was more described as a, a mini compact, yeah, a two-seater mobile that has been popular at that time, yeah, until now, I guess in terms of the size, yeah, because even electric car also has this kind of size. And also, if we talk about smart cars, we might also refer, like nowadays, is a vehicle, any vehicle with an internet connection, yeah. So it is connected to the internet, yeah. So it is the basics, the basis of the connected car, yeah. A vehicle that equipped with internet connectivity, yeah, a range of sensor communication device that allow it to interact with its surroundings. Yeah, I think we uh, most likely can see this technology uh, apply uh, in effective, efficient, and very good or optimum in uh, smart city using the Internet of Things technology where the convergent technology. Yeah, uh, there are a couple of smart, smart cars that uh, we can refer. That's why. Why electric cars, autonomous car, or even flying cars can be considered a smart car? Uh, some of the scope that we put it remember is advanced driving system, connectivity, autonomous driving levels, yeah, cooperative intelligent transport system, predictive analytic data collection, analysis, urban mobility solution. There is energy efficiency, environmental impact, yeah. Uh, there are many, yeah. Uh, now, uh, we are going to the electric cars, yeah. Uh, electric cars, I think when we are talking about electric cars, there are four uh, different kind of uh, electric cars. Uh, one that I think it's becoming very famous nowadays is battery electric vehicle or BEV. And this is uh, the one that is uh, electric, yeah. And the second one is plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. This one is hybrid, so they, they can use a uh, they have both a motor and internal combustion engines, yeah. Uh, this had the, the electric and then range extended electric vehicle. This one is hybrid, yeah. This uh, between the electric motor, yeah. Uh, but do not use internal combustion engine instead uh, using gasoline, yeah. And then full cell electric vehicle or FCE. This one use uh, electricity and as a reaction between hydrogen and oxygen. So these electric cars can be considered smart cars because how it operates, it definitely uses the connected cars technology, electric demand, storage capacity, and electric supply. 
Uh, I think we need why we need electric cars. Uh, one of the main reason is uh, environmental uh, reason. I think we will go deeper by uh, by the second speaker by Mr. Ira. Yeah, we will not go into detail into this. And also for Indonesia interest, electric cars is very much can contribute uh, massively to our economics. Uh, why? Because uh, in Indonesia, uh, we are uh, we can be considered as a country with the biggest producer of nick nickel. Nickel is the material that is very important for electric uh, battery. Uh, so, however, there is of course a problem with the uh, have uh, electric cars to be implemented in Indonesia. Uh, the law and regulation is start uh, to be produced. I um, mean, start to use and launch uh, like uh, ten of regulation at least. Yeah, so this is a good start. The ex uh, ante approach here, but I think there is a problem. For example, the challenge of implement for the electricals to be implemented directly is, for example, how to make the public awareness, public awareness, uh, realize that. This is, uh, we should use electric cars other than still using gasoline, yeah, so using the internal combustion engine car, yeah. So it needs education, yeah. And then of course we need infrastructure, new technology, meaning we need new infrastructure that are very different than the, uh, of course there is another issue like secondhand market. Uh, for example, if we buy, uh, if we use electric, can this electric car have a durability as least as long as the gasoline, as uh, as long as the internal combustion engine, or actually, the reality is still uh, very short. Yeah, and then even when you sell it again, probably don't get uh, money much less than it should. So, and now second one is autonomous car or self driving car. This probably is already implemented in some countries better than in Indonesia. Yeah, uh, I think we could talk about self driving cars. Uh, we know that the came from Elon Musk as well. Yeah, uh, uh, company ta uh, Tesla. Yeah, self driving cars are the natural extension of active safety and obviously something we should. People think that uh, autonomous car is only ready in or actually is useful in the developed country rather than in developing countries but actually the one that need more uh, of uh, autonomous car actually is developing country where uh, the rate of accident uh, is the fatality is quite high yeah and i think that the, the purpose of autonomous self-driving cars one of the reason is to limit it or make minimize yeah minimize the uh, the ability or the accident uh, road. I will not go into detail about the technology because this will be tackled by uh, Valentina and Pedro. Alice, um, you will have three minutes left. Okay. So, flying cars, yeah. Uh, about flying cars. Uh, flying cars, I think it's very much in the past, it's uh, because of the fantasy that when we see uh, back to the future cars, yeah, this is the DeLorean, yeah, and the movie was back in 1980. Yeah. Uh, I think we can call it as an ultimate symbol of freedom, independence, and individualism, yeah, because you have the freedom to go anywhere. Uh, this is probably right because when you use flying car, you can go uh, without following the route, like when you uh, drive a car. The land, yeah, and I think it's worth mention about the technology of the flying cars is the term of flying car FC and the urban air mobility, which also consists of uh, electric, electric vehicle takeoff landing. And the current technology currently used a rotary wing aircraft. I think we can uh, say this one using the technology of uh, helicopter. Meanwhile, fixed wing aircraft using the technology like airplane. So there are these advantage and disadvantage from using these technologies. Yeah, but this is the current technology. So flying car and urban 
air mobility might not necessarily the same. Yeah. And then also what mentioned is between flying car, uh, between not every flying car is already uh, can be used uh, or can be buy commercially. We can see from this, for example, Xpeng, you can buy now, yeah. But for example, clean kitchen air car is not uh, widely used, yeah, because it's not even commercially produced yet. Alex model can start to be used on 2025, yeah. Flying car, uh, why is needed? Yeah, beside traffic, uh, efficient, of course, time saving, and reduce environmental impact. Of course, this is uh, depends on the what kind of technology, whether you use the rotary wing aircraft or the one that uh, using the airplane technology. Uh, balance, of course, cost, regulatory frameworks, public acceptance, yeah, safety concern. Uh, yeah, I think it's also worth to be mentioned is some area of laws in uh, implementing a, a Playing cars is the efficient law, regulatory compliance, safety standard, infrastructure regulation, insurance, liability. Yeah. From Indonesia perspective, this is really need government support. Yeah. We have some plan, for example, by working together with Hyundai uh, for enhanced air mobility project in our future capital, Tara. And also, uh, there is so much needs to uh, be done for public perception. Yeah, because whenever we are trying to move to new technology, we it's not only the responsible of the government, but it is responsible of the society to accept. So in order for for us to uh, use it uh, widely, of course we need technology maturity, uh, maturity regulatory matters, and operational uh, issue is also something. Last but not least, yeah, I think when we talk about future cars, there will be more and more, especially uh, the maturity of the technology for the current technology of cars like electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and uh, connected cars. Uh, but the most important thing, in order for the technology of cars is a fun develop and then can be affordable, can be used by many people, it, it requires a multi-stakeholder approach where so that uh, Technology the interplay between technology advancement, regulatory development, economic factors, and social is something that determine how the future cars develop and can be affordable to people. Uh, this is one of the statements. This is uh, Alfred from Alfred Sloan. He, he, he was the former CEO of General Motors. A car for every purse and purpose. So it means that when we have more option, it is good for for consumer for the people, because uh, it means that everybody have their uh, access to to uh, use car to buy the cars. Of course, it also mean we might not necessarily buy the car, but we can also use the uh, public transport too. Thank you very much. This is from me. I hope this brief introduction from me can be applied by audience to some extent. I will be welcome. Thank you, Ferdowsi, for your presentation. It is interesting to remind us back to the innovation we had since the early time of cars and bring us to what have uh, what we have to foresee right now. Next, we will have the second speaker, Mahawira Singh Dilon. MCLLM. Vera Dillon is an alumnus of ANU with a Master's of Climate Change, graduating in 2014. Currently, Vera is a communication associate in the Global Strategic Communications Council, a mentor in Think Policy Society, as well as head of the Indonesian Board Game Association. And before this latest GFCC post, Wira has worked for almost a decade as a policy researcher in Yayasan Spectrum Pelangi Indonesia and Yayasan Indonesia Cerah. Wira is also an ardent advocate of adult learning through board games with his board game about climate change titled MEC, currently going through a second reprint and dissemination campaign. Wira will be talking about smart cars from an environmentalist perspective. Well, Wira, 
Vera Dillon, uh, the time is yours right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayu. Let me try to share my screen and try to slide show. <clears throat> okay. Hopefully everyone, <clears throat> everyone can see this well enough. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the chance to uh, speak at this QMO, uh, Queen Mary uh, University event. So let's start to talk about uh, smart cars and its uh, impacts on the climate. So we will first talk about how climate change is happening, how it started, and how humans have started to make it smart at the geological you know, uh, scale. And then we'll talk about the uh, redux of uh, Firdaus's uh, presentation about uh, smart cars. And, and then I'll talk about uh, Indonesia's current policies regarding to climate change and its relations to smart cars. As well as finally, we'll talk about how the governments, uh, the governance of smart cars could be better in the future. So uh, the Anthropocene is a new epoch that we've entered. Uh, basically, scientists around the world have noticed how human activities have made uh, market changes to how the world, uh, the physical world uh, works. So as we can see here, especially starting in the 1850s where uh, scientists started taking um, temperature measurements around the world, we can see how the average uh, temperature has gone up and it's really gone up in the last uh, 50 years. Now, through ice core sampling, we can also see how uh, for hundreds and thousands of years, the climate, uh, the, the carbon dioxide concentrations in, the, uh, in on earth has remained relatively stable. There are fluctuations, definitely. But ever since the 1850s, ever since the 1950s, there has been a remarkable increase. And in the last 70 years, it's increased exponentially. Now, the increase of carbon dioxide means that uh, the more infrared radiation are being caught in the atmosphere, which means more energy is being caught in the atmosphere, which produces more extreme weather patterns. So if you've noticed that sometimes we have uh, longer periods of drought and then uh, more he heavy torrential rain as well as uh, uh, storms and cyclones, that is due to the amount of energy increasing uh, being caught in the atmosphere. So this is the problem with climate change because as we increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we will see more extreme weather patterns and more extreme changes in uh, our climate. Now, this relates as well to the what scientists have called the planetary boundary layers. So uh, they they have uh, yeah planetary boundaries. Uh, they have you know uh, underlined various things we should keep track of, and uh, they have noticed how out of the nine, like we have exceeded. Uh, recommended limits for quite a few of them. Now, uh, when we are talking about smart cars, we are hoping that somehow we are slowly getting into a circular economy where we can sustain the amount of growth and uh, the amount of uh, development within a more sustainable frame in regards to Earth, Earth's physical limits. Now, uh, the issue uh, later on, we'll talk about resource efficiency as well as uh, as uh, the simplest proxy of resource efficiency we will talk about is uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, per utility of cars, which we will get to later. Now, this is a concept that is going around. Don donut economics is also there, so uh, please feel free to explore further. Now, all of this is also related to how uh, there's a growth hierarchy in this world and how uh, we tend to still have a very extractive mindset in regards to the economy. And when, as long as that mindset it persists, it might be hard to really transition towards a more sustainable method of production and consumption. Now, when we talk about the potential of smart cars to bring about uh, better economic growth, we will also have to remember that uh, all of, most of the components still require some extractive uh, 
mining and there are issues that when these uh, resources are being extracted from developing countries there tend to be you know human rights violations and uh, the weakening of safeguards in uh, less developed countries for mostly for the benefit of more developed economies again uh, concepts of world systems and dependency theory talks a lot about this uh, there are links uh, in the presentation i will share them in the chat later and please feel free to contact uh, the organizers for the link and hopefully we can have a more in-depth discussion if you want it to go this way uh, during the q a now we know from uh, Firdausi's uh, um, presentation the general um, options we have when we are talking about smart cars. I'll oversimplify it. So there are three kinds of smart cars here. There are electric cars, there are autonomous cars, and there are flying cars. Uh, the, the technology is diverging as well as converging in the sense that there are autonomous cars which are also electric cars, but currently there are already also some autonomous cars which are not fully electric. And we are still uh, in the nascent stage of uh, developing flying cars, but uh, it is not beyond the realm of possibility that in the future, those flying cars will also be electric. Currently, most flying cars are still uh, manual, but it, again, we could uh, see autonomous flying cars in the near future as well. Now, the issue that, uh, you know, for when we are looking from an environmental lens about all these cars, um, this is again as an oversimplification, uh, but basically electric cars has the potential to uh, abate climate change, but as always mass tra transit options are always better. So electric buses, electric trains are always better than electric cars. We understand that uh, the hype around electric cars and smart cars are a way given the current economy uh, when you you can only change one thing, how do you make people's consumption somewhat more sustainable? Then yes, electric cars might be a solution. But if we can change more, then there are further steps that we can go. And it always leads towards transit, mass transit options. Now, autonomous cars have been shown to potentially reduce... Um, so uh, on its own, autonomous cars have the potential to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, but this will only, you know, scale up if we have a fully autonomous uh, grid or a fully autonomous uh, transport network, which again means that when you have a mass transit options, we can supplant these non-autonomous uh, networks and still uh, create much more uh, carbon dioxide savings rather than just uh, developing autonomous cars, whereas uh, many will still not be autonomous. Um, as well, uh, and later on, flying cars. Flying cars look great. It looks uh, technologically advanced, but the amount of energy required to achieve lift is still not efficient. And more often than not, you will find that, again, mass transit is a better option. Um, so this is a graph. I know it It lists just about everything. So FCEV is... Uh, fuel cell EV, uh, electric vehicles, uh, BEV battery electric vehicles, HEV is, um, I think it's a hybrid electric vehicles, IC is internal combustion engines, and uh, the you know all the different options. As you can see, uh, ride sourcing, uh, taxis, and private car options at all, uh, you know, uh, different kinds of technologies st still emit way more uh, carbon dioxide per, uh, kilogram passenger mile so um, and they've also put uh, bikes there which is goes to show that uh, the top options uh, when it comes to mass transit uh, it's always better for mass transit options or personal transit options which requires much less energy much less uh, materials for the body of the car itself this is a life cycle analysis of smart cars so when we're talking about are smart cars uh, worth it? Uh, they're using the smart cars as generally as possible. Uh, they are, uh, you know, comparing smart petrol vehicles against smart electric vehicles, and you can see that even in a grid where uh, where the grid is not yet uh, fully renewable, they do confer savings and they do allow for a better transition towards renewables in the future in the long run. 
So um, that I understand this can get a bit confusing and some people will say, you know, what's the point of having electric vehicles when the grid is still mostly coal? Uh, that is an understandable uh, objection. But again, if we have more electric vehicles in the uh, network, then we can shift away from fossil fuels, from liquid fossil fuels, usually for cars, petrol, and then we can, by having more demand for energy through electric grids, we can push for renewable energy as well because uh, renewable energy does lose out in terms of uh, non-grid uh, options, not off-grid op options, but non-grid op grid options. Whereas uh, you know making biofuels, etc., as, uh, as densely as energy dense as petrol, it has always been a hard issue. So if we can force uh, the demand towards grid-based uh, solutions, then it, it becomes easier. And when asked whether there are designs for the cars, uh, for smart cars to ensure that they are sustainable, basically the designs do not go towards the car itself because uh, there, are, there are only, you know, minuscule uh, benefits from making cars uh, from their physical design. But if we can design the, uh, the value chain, the supply chain, then we can design how safeguards and due diligence, where we are getting the materials, that is what, what is most important in ensuring the least amount of um, human rights abuses, the least amount of uh, other issues, uh, as well as, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that, that there are uh, regulations about life cycle analysis and re producer responsibility. So uh, this means that producers have to take care of the whole cycle of life from uh, production to uh, when we uh, when people stop using it. Uh, and here comes the principles of design for recycling because uh, currently uh, smart cars requires battery, requires critical minerals. And those are usually the points of contention when people say that, okay, you use so, so much critical minerals, how are you better than uh, fossil fuels? Uh, the main thing we can show here is that fossil fuels are non-renewable, whereas critical minerals, after they are used in batteries, after the, the active life is done, if we uh, prepare to recycle them properly, then we could reclaim them and we could make new batteries out of them. Now, this is the importance of really having the design principles for them to be ready to be reused, because otherwise, currently, most are not being recycled because it becomes uh, too expensive to recycle. But again, with uh, sufficient regulation, we could ensure that this uh, cost for uh, recycling later is not externalized, but internalized by the producer so that we can show uh, through the pricing mechanism that it is important to think about uh, afterlife issues. And finally, always pushing for transparency, good governance are, are good principles to live by. We'll get back to this in later uh, after everything else. Right. So next, uh, let's cover first uh, what Indonesia plans to do. Uh, we are currently seeing Can COP and I see, yeah. Okay, uh, so five minutes left. Okay, thank you for the reminder. Uh, we'll just go uh, through this pretty quickly. I'm just going to give an overview of what Indonesia plans to do. Uh, generally, uh, COP is ongoing. I see uh, uh, Queen Mary University also has been posting a lot about COP. So uh, Indonesia just announced its JETP CIPP, uh, Climate Investment uh, Plan, basically. And you can see the plan for the energy mix in the future which hopefully means more renewables seems like a, a great thing. Um, installed capacity is going up and we seem to be shifting out uh, fossil fuels. Again, um, that changes also shows that we will be going for more renewables, which is great. Um, and yeah, uh, we will be reducing our on-grid emissions, which means when we plug our cars, our electric cars to the grid, uh, less emissions in the future, yay. Now, uh, this is all well and good because LCOE is the uh, levelized cost of electricity. We can see how renewables will keep on uh, becoming cheaper, whereas coal, etc., might be uh, plateauing or even going uh, more expensive. Um, and then uh, Indonesia itself also plans to reduce its overall emissions and electric cars has been mentioned passingly as one of the ways we can achieve that. They will uh, attempt to go first uh, force uh, the national fleet, the national uh, governmental fleet to go electric. And um, again, this is uh, Indonesia's long-term strategy for low carbon development. And 
their plans about deforestation as well. Um, this ties into potentially uh, expansion about mining, but we are seeing how nickel mining in the last two, three years in Indonesia has been expanding because of demand for EVs. And we are still allocating some level of uh, deforestation. So again, if we, we can talk about how uh, the growth of EVs might impact this. Now, finally, let's talk about how uh, we can ensure the governments uh, of uh, these smart cars are getting better in the future or how we can improve them. Uh, first and foremost, uh, there has there has there is yet to be a one singular um, law to uh, preside over all EV uh, related or smart car related issues, but these are just an overview of what currently there are. Most of them talk about uh, the infrastructure, the charging, uh, recharging stations, the tax rate, uh, whether they are luxury goods and what components are needed to, uh, you know, what what makes a, an electric vehicle an electric vehicle as opposed to other types of vehicles, uh, the specifications, and as well as um, when when we want to convert an existing uh, body uh, to an electric vehicle, what are the specifications and considerations needed? But most of them do not talk about environmental sustainability or, or climate change. Now, again, we come back to these points that uh, there are issues uh, potentially that will arise uh, unless we really specify the regulations around them and really ensure that uh, producers and consumers are aware that you know we are transitioning towards something better. Yes, but again, uh, personal uh, electrification is not the, the long-term solution. We need to talk about how to make mass transit more sustainable as well as more appealing so that more people will use it. So are smart cars revolutionary? No, not really. I think Firdausi also has presented how uh, the car has evolved in the last 150 years. Uh, but again, uh, the push for personal vehicles may well undermine mass transit issues, mass transit options, and that might not, you know, that might uh, reduce its potential for uh, reducing the impact, for mitigating the impacts of climate change. There are legacy issues to be tackled. These are issues about production, issues about human rights abuses, about uh, developmental uh, justice, um, uh, child labor. And that remains true with non-electric uh, vehicle, uh, you know, internal combustion engine uh, vehicles, as well as electric uh, smart cars. So uh, when we want to, pr uh, you know, promote the smart car as a, a good solution, then we need to uh, acknowledge and tackle these issues better. Now, uh, I, for one, am quite an optimist in the sense that I think that these changes may be a good chance as any for reform. Uh, we are also, you know, uh, in my line of work, I also work with uh, industrial associations and they are pushing for better governance. So fingers crossed, let's keep working on it. But sadly, all this hype about uh, smart cars seems to be it's, uh, business as usual. People are still, you know, a bit too uh, self-centered uh, in regards to their pleasure pain uh, recommendation. I mean, considerations in the sense that they will prefer, yeah, I'll I'll buy a smart car, uh, electric vehicle, so long as I can uh, do it comfortably rather than going through mass transit because mass transit everywhere, even when it's uh, quite convenient, quite good, uh, usually needs high levels of uh, regulations and or nudges in the sense to make the people really use it. Uh, a good example might be from Singapore. They have multiple levels of uh, taxation for personal vehicles, but that has really made their MRT system, their mass transit system, uh, so much better because of a high usage. And yeah, they can subsidize that and make people prefer it than to uh, use cars. So that's it from me. Thank you very much and Merdeka. Thank you, Ira, for your presentation. Well, we have received uh, the environmental viewpoint when it comes to embrace the smart cars, considering all countries are obliged to prioritize their uh, sustainability and energy saving in the recent days. Hence, we are heading to the first Q&A session. We will allocate um, around three questions in this session. Um, we already have some, uh, we already have one patient coming from Kirdausi, but I have mine as the moderator. 
to us for Firdausi and Wira. Well, okay. So the first question is coming from Mr. Firdausi Fridaus from UB, University of Barcelona. Well, the question for Wira is, as a researcher and I consider you as an activist, I was wondering how public acceptance can be achieved, in particular, knowing our Indonesian culture, who tend to like to use cars so badly. We did need more than a decade to convince Indonesia society to use electric cars. Please, Mr. Wira. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. If we still prefer cars in general, electric vehicles, especially there's already a lot of subsidies towards electric vehicles and they're buying for it, they're going for it. Most consumers don't have much of a choice beyond the economic consideration. So as long as you make it comparable, they will probably go for it. Um, and I hear the, the government might be going in a big way because, again, it's a big government project thing. They want enough... Uh, in a, a demand for it so it might be uh quicker and uh, easier but currently i mean if we can talk uh is, is this i don't know this is recorded i get uh but you know let, let me put it bluntly uh currently the main um uh, the, the main issue with uh ev transition in indonesia uh, are the car manufacturers they have invested quite a lot in factories for internal combustion engines and they are still reaping the benefits for it so unless there are regulations to shift them uh, quicker they would uh, probably prefer to get their money back first and then uh, uh, retool their uh, um, uh, their yeah, fabrication stations towards uh, evs but yeah, that is happening anyway. Uh, people are going there. We are making smelters here and there. So uh, yeah, uh, internal combustion engines will still be there. Uh, but I guess uh, especially the up to 2030, we might see a large implementation of it. Uh, the government is still focused on the new, uh, uh, new um, yeah, uh, EKM. So sorry. Uh, but then afterwards, they will probably. Uh, go for uh, electric uh, electric vehicles in a big way i am hoping that we were we will see much more rap, uh, mass transit options as well because i as again uh, personal vehicle options are not the solution but currently why you see that uh, indonesians like electric vehicles uh, sorry like cars in general that is also because uh, we have been catering to the uh, desires to the lobbyists of the car industry thank you Vira. Um, Mr. Firdausi, are you satisfied with the answer from Vera? Or is there any counterback from you, Firdausi? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay. So, no, thank you. Thank you, Vera. Thank you, Rina. Okay. Um, thank you, Vera, and thank you, Aussie, for the questions. So the next question will be coming from me as the moderator. Well, uh, we are talking about the smart cars and the electric cars. Well, it is claimed that the smart cars are more energy saving and environmentally friendly than the conventional cars that produce the, em uh, the emissions. However, uh, what is your perspective if the main energy of smart cars is coming from the electric power? Well, in Indonesia, the biggest power plants are not yet fully car uh, environmentally friendly and still produce the emissions that Indonesia is still struggling to fulfill the standard emissions. Do you think it is still much energy safer than the conventional car? And because the main power is the electricity and the electrical power in Indonesia is coming from full fired power plant. Please, Mr. Yeah. So yes, in general, uh, yes. I mean, especially if you compare it to places where we have to transport the uh, liquid fuel. So when you have an internal, internal combustion engine, let's say I live somewhere in, uh, uh, somewhere where uh, it takes quite a bit to get the fuel there. Uh, so like if I live in Jakarta, it's easy enough for me to get liquid fuel. But uh, in the boondocks, uh, in areas where the roads are not that good, um, the, it's easier to build a, an electrical line uh, because we only need to take the coal to a centralized uh, power uh, station, right? And then it's burned there, it produces emissions, but then that energy is transported everywhere through cables, mostly without loss. Whereas if I were to use an internal combustion engine in a secluded area, uh, I will need Pertamina to use their uh, ground fleet, which requires oil to, to bring the oil to me. 
So uh, that amount of uh, distribution loss uh, means that electric vehicles on principle already uh, save you emissions. And then, as I said earlier, uh, when we have more demand for electricity, it's easier to convert uh, towards to transition to renewables in the electricity grid compared to, to transition to re renewables in the internal combustion engine. So currently we have biofuels as well, but biofuels are not as energy dense as oil. Uh, it's nearing there, uh, but uh, so like a liter of biofuel might produce two thirds the energy of a liter of uh, uh, petroleum oil. And that's one of the issues, right? Th that's a rough number, please don't quote me on it. But the principle is there that uh, black oil is a miracle in the sense that it's so energy dense, it's so easy to transport. That's why we've become addicted to it. Now, when we are going to transition away from it, and we should because Indonesia has been a net importer for over 20 years now, and the world will run out of it sooner or later, uh, the way to go is electricity. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wira, for the explanation. Well, um, the next question will be uh, given for, for Mr. Firdausi, and we have one from Muhammad Iqbal. Uh, good evening, uh, Ms. Arini. Actually, this question is for Mr. Wira, uh, so... Oh, Hello? Yes, um, Iqbal, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Rini, for the opportunity. I'm sorry I couldn't turn on my turn my camera on because I had connection issues. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Weir regarding uh, regulations because you've mentioned uh, quite quite uh but no regulations, but there's uh, there's certain regulations from I'm from where I'm working that we're giving incentive to banks that provide uh fundings and loans uh, in regards to uh, in regards to banks that uh, how should I say uh to banks that provide a loan and funding for consumers that's uh, uh that provide the that provide uh, loans and funding for people who purchase electric electric vehicle like they're they're being given the incentives by the central bank of indonesia to have their uh, statutory uh, statutory statutory uh, how do you say statutory reserve requirement in bank of indonesia so they're being incentivized that they have they can have less amount of money uh, reserved in the central banks for the cost of uh, funding and loans. And there are also other incentives uh, that are given to certain banks that uh, provide loans and fundings for those that build power plants, uh, doing mineral, uh, provide funding and loans for minerals as well. And there are also incentives in the, uh, by the minis uh, Ministry of I kind of forgot what kind of place. So that stage, uh, ga uh, the gas station, uh, quote unquote, for electric vehicles are free and, ex and accessible. Do you think that these type of incentives are sufficient for, uh, for increasing the amount of electric vehicle consumption and uh, Purchase. Yeah. Uh, so is it sufficient? Um, I would say no, because here's the thing: uh, we are seeing more deployment of electric vehicles. It's get uh, it's quite a hit nowadays. And as I said earlier, the the amount of uh, subsidies, as you uh, mentioned as well, does play into that. But every year, Indonesia still subsidizes liquid fuels. Uh, we still subsidize it to the degree, I think uh, it's about um, 500 uh, trillion rupiah every year, I think, yeah. Um, and uh, I have yet to see that being reduced because that is a very sensitive issue and people usually dislike it. Uh, the, the issue, I think, being that uh, 
yeah, the, the, this has been a, a general subsidy rather than a specified, uh, you know, a surgical knife subsidy to people who really need it. But most people who have uh, their personal cars are enjoying the fact that we, it, uh, the fuel cost in Indonesia is still very cheap. Pertamina is making money hand and fist um, being subsidized for fuel. We are a net importer uh, and I understand why we are doing it. They don't want the shock to the economy, but it's silly. So we are spending that much money to keep internal combustion engines going. We are spending a little bit of money to subsidize people to go into uh, electric vehicles. So is it sufficient to fully overturn? Um, no, definitely not. Because that amount of subsidy, how 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 much it, it is, I still don't think it compares to 500 trillion uh, rupiah per year. Um, so unless it, it equalizes, unless they slowly reduce that 500 trillion uh, pr uh, point, you know, uh, towards more subsidies towards EVs, then we will still see a majority of uh, internal combustion engines. Thank you, Ira, for the explanation. Iqbal, um, do you think uh, Ira has addressed all of the questions that you have? Uh, yes, Lord, and thank you very much, Ira. Thank you very much. Uh... Okay, thank you, Iqbal, for the question. So uh, I will have one question for Mr. Firdausi. Well, what is the role of competition law in electric sector in Indonesia? Can you explain more about it? for us because we are coming from different jurisdictions and we would like to see um, how is the competition law in electric sector in Indonesia? Who is Mr. Pirdausi? You're still on uh, mute. Test, test. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. I think when we are uh, talking about competition law, uh, it's, the same like any kind of any, any other technology. Yeah, in particular for this one, yeah, electric vehicle. Uh, because when you start to, uh, in order for the technology to be used widely, publicly, uh, it needs uh, a lot of, uh, we need to have a good, uh, healthy ecosystem, right? And then one of the healthy ecosystem is how, uh, People who get to the market, yeah, who play, who enter the market, like enter the market, uh, the industry is not uh, monopolized by some some entities, some companies, yeah, and also this will have a we have a direct connection with the consumer protection, where it will give uh, more uh, consumer to uh, to have option because when there is no competition. Uh, people will uh, become complacent, yeah, and this is usually uh, will make the uh, consumer, especially the one that will be most uh, the vulnerable part. Yeah, that's the simple one. Um, because uh, when there is no competition in a good competition law, there will be uh, price fixing. Yeah, for example, and then when there is a dominance, yeah, the the, the price, yeah it will be according to the profit of the entities that rule the market, yeah, which is might be too uh, less affordable for people. And then uh, let's be clear, especially from Indonesia perspective, uh, when we are uh, talking about cars, it's likely sometimes I feel like it's a primary because sometimes people, I see they don't have house, but they have cars. <laughs> so uh, this one in particular, is really need competition and competition law. I do not uh, see yet that uh, how much the sophisticated, but there are some of the regulation yeah, about, for example, about the battery, uh, battery uh, instruction president number 22, 2021, if I'm mistaken, maybe, maybe I can uh, correct me the number, but it is one of the ways or method of the government to give a smell of the competition, yeah, so that people who can enter the market uh, to, uh, to to run a business, for example, in uh, especially a battery, uh, battery, electric battery vehicle. Because some of my old friends whom I know from uh, high school, from undergrads, they do they do the business in battery uh, electric vehicle. So it is actually attractive. So it is a good start. Because they are coming from different background, 
Uh, so it's so I see it as well that it is actually a good start. We just know uh, how consistent is the law when it's being uh, uh, implemented in the reality. So I think that's I, I'm I'm I'm, ask, I'm talking this in more simple. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Audi. Thank you for all the participants who have uh, raised the questions. Well, we will have another three speakers coming up to share their knowledge about the data protection, artificial intelligence, and ultimately flying cars. I believe more questions will be coming up, uh, either from the panelists, from the participants, or anyone that um, give us some questions about the topic. Well, please carefully pay attention for the materials and state your questions in the chat room. So we will continue to the next sessions to the third speaker from Valentina Torelli, MLLM, CIPPE. Valentina is an alumni from CCLS Queen Mary University of London with an LLM in Computer and Communication Law, graduating in 2020. Valentina is an Italian qualified lawyer and practices in Milan as senior associate at Grimaldi Alliance. Valentina advises clients in all fields of IP, IT, and new technology law with a special focus on data protection and privacy issues. Her practice focuses on data protection compliance projects, privacy by design, and privacy by default, strategies data transfer compliance, data bridges man management, data protection impact assessment, etc. Valentina also provides assistance with regard to data protection issues in relation to e-commerce, online applications, as well as legal aspects of Metaverse and AI. The topic presented by Ms. Valentina is about the data protection and privacy in smart cars. So Ms. Valentina, please kindly share us your insights and knowledge in the sessions. The time is yours, Valentina. Please. Thank you. Rini and Firdausi, all the colleagues uh, contributing and the attendees participating to this CCLS um, joint alumni uh, webinar. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. And um, as Rimi anticipated the presentation uh, uh, of today, uh, will revolve on privacy and data protection issues uh, in connection with the so-called smart cars here in the European Union and uh, in Italy. As a general remark, please consider that Italy is an EU member state and therefore all the considerations that we can draw on according to the EU law will also apply in Italy. And uh, in the next uh, 15 minutes, more or less, um, I will uh, provide a high-level overview of these um, privacy and data protection issues. If we cannot finish the presentation, please feel free to contact me and to ask for the slides of this uh, um, presentation. So just have a look at the agenda of today. We will start with the definition and uh, um, the uh, most common attributes of uh, smart cars under the EU and uh, uh, the Italy uh, legislation. We will then uh, consider the legal background uh, and rules that influence the um, regulation of smart cars. Um, then we will um, delve into the collection and processing of personal data through smart cars. And so we will address um, the most uh, relevant uh, issues uh, and criticalities in connection with such collection and processing in order to then consider how to uh, mitigate the risk associated with the uh, personal data processing uh, in, in connection with smart cars. There are a few use cases uh, at the end of the presentation concerning the deployment of smart cars in Italy, uh, France, and Germany, and then we will can wrap up and uh, draw our uh, conclusions. So we have talk about smart cars so far, and now we discover that there's no definition of smart car <laughs> in the EU and uh, um, in the Italian legislation. But because indeed uh, we needed to consider the acronym CAV and the denomination mostly adopted by the EU institutions and the national institutions having an exercising um, legislative powers that are um, the definitions of uh, connected vehicles um, that are vehicles equipped with those devices that 
allowed to communicate um, with other vehicles or with an infrastructure over the internet. The definition of automated vehicles uh, that are those vehicles equipped with the technologies that assist the drivers uh, in some of the um, driving uh, tasks. Um, and automated vehicles as the, the definition, the word, the terminology uh, suggests are different from autonomous vehicles where the uh, driving functions are uh, fully uh, automated and fully delegated to the vehicle instead of um, the driver. So from a definition perspective, we may consider um, those CAVs, those connected and autonomous or automated vehicles also as a IoT devices and uh, a um, series of initiatives at the EU level, which also have impact uh, at national level, have to be um, analyzed. Uh, for instance, uh, the um, European data strategies, which has uh, the objective to create a, a data-driven uh, society and a single market uh, uh, for data, where... Um, it is possible to pool European data in key sectors, such as the sector of uh, transportation and mobility, um, and create interoperable uh, common data spaces with specific rules uh, on the management uh, uh, and the sharing of, of those data. As well as, for instance, uh, um, the sustainable and smart mobility strategy brought forward by the European Commission, which aims at having uh, automated mobility uh, deployed uh, at large scale by 2030 and uh, um, basically a trans-European transport network which allows the interconnection and the uh, communication um, and, and, and the possibility to drive from one country uh, to another in the EU by 2050 as well as uh, as I said before um, the creation of uh, um, European mobility data spaces. Um, in with regard to the definition of uh, CAV, uh, connected uh, autonomous and autonomous uh, um, vehicles. Also, um, the legislation about uh, cooperative intelligent transport systems, as also mentioned by Fyodor Uzi, um, is very relevant because uh, those intelligent transport systems um, use information communication technologies uh, in the in the field of uh, um, in the field of. Um, uh, of transport. And uh, as regards, uh, for instance, uh, uh, sorry, I don't know what happened. Um, yeah, okay. And as regards, for instance, uh, um, um, do you prefer to have presentations to play or would you prefer without presentations? Yeah, I was. I was sharing this screen actually before, um, so uh, yeah. It's just come up so right I, now. yeah, uh, that's yeah. a point. So and uh, I'm sorry for uh, for uh, the 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 disrupt the disruption. And um, as I said before, uh, in Italy we have uh, uh, we have a decree and a definition of of uh, self uh, driving vehicles basically um, in in application of the EU legislation um, to be considered as those equipped uh, um, technologies which uh, are capable of ad of adopting autonomous behavior uh, during the driving mo mo uh, mobility. So. Mm, smart cars also feature some attributes that are most common and allow for uh, the um, collection uh, of data and uh, are at the basis of the two main characteristics, which are the connectivity to uh, an infrastructure and uh, uh, to other devices, such as uh, smartphones uh, owned by the older, uh, the, the, the older of the device or uh, um, the, the the road uh, traffic management and science. And uh, those attributes span from uh, a long range radar, which can be used for emergency braking and adaptive cruise control, to cameras, which allow the surround view, uh, assist the driver in parking, and uh, um, provide warning in case of uh, lane departure. And uh, uh, most and foremost, um, 
the uh, LUDAR um, technology, uh, which is uh, um, basically a laser scan and uh, a methodology uh, to use uh, the light in the form of a pulse uh, uh, laser which allow to create a 3D maps of the environment and uh, permit the vehicles to understand its position um, on its own and relatively uh, towards other objects, which can be um, other cars, other vehicles, and as well as uh, persons such as uh, pedestrians. Then as regards the characteristic of autonomy, um, we need to refer to a uh, commonly recognized and adopted standard, uh, which is uh, the Society of Automotive Engineers standard, the J3016, uh, which allows to classify vehicles and their uh, classification into au automated or autonomous vehicles according to the degree of delegations and uh, transfer of driving uh, uh, capabilities uh, to the driver only, to the driver with assistance of the vehicle, and here we are in the category of uh, um, automated vehicles, or uh, fully to the um, to the vehicle. In in this case, we have uh, autonomous vehicles, and um, according to the plan of the EU institutions by 2030. Um, autonomous vehicle should become uh, a commonplace uh, in, uh, in the EU and for this reason we have uh, um, a sheer amount of legislation. This is a very highly regulated environment and uh, here there's a map of um, how the national legislations are approaching to the, the, uh, to the uh, transposition of all the EU legislation um, into their national jurisdictions according to the different type of level of autonomy of the um, of the autonomous vehicles according to the standard that I showed before. So here uh, is in Portugal, Spain and Italy, we are only allowed to use uh, level two autonomy um, vehicles, which allow for partial automation, as you can see, and according to the, the driving option, which involve uh, the steering, the acceleration, the acceleration, or uh, um, the monitoring of the driving environment, there always should be some sort of control on the part of the, of, of the driver. In other countries, uh, such as in the UK, level three is already being implemented at national level. And uh, in Germany, in France, and Switzerland, according to specific conditions, the law also allows for four uh, uh, level of autonomy. In general, we have to say that the European countries, which are signatories to the um, Vienna Convention on Transportation, um, of transport, on road transport, um, uh, have passed the amendment of an article, which is the Article 34 bis, which allows for um, the introduction at the national legislation level of um, three um, a level of autonomy in, uh, in smart cars. Uh, as regards the legal framework uh, influencing um, data protection um, in connection with smart cars, the, the um, standard uh, legislation is the GDPR the General Data Protection Regulation. This is the um, law that must be applied every time that the smart cars uh, um, intended as a CAV, is a connected and or automated autonomous vehicle, collect and process information related directly or indirectly to natural persons. Then we have the e-privacy directive, which concerned the processing of personal data and the protection of privacy in electronic communication sector. So we understand that where there's a connectivity to an infrastructure or to other devices, such as the uh, smartphones or other cars, as I said before, this kind of legislation is, is really important. And um, as a standard rule uh, developed by the European Data Protection Board, which is the AD PB, uh, we can consider it like uh, the European Supervisory Authority matter of data protection. Um, there's a rule um, which requests that in order to read the information or store information in terms of tracking technologies or also um, um, connections uh, on a device uh, such as 
a smart car can be considered uh, consent on the part of the data subject uh, uh, controlling using that device is needed unless there are two options two exemptions um, and one is uh, the necessity to provide an information society service on the request of the person of the data subject which can be the example of uh, a gps uh, um, function within the use of a smart car or um, where uh, the processing of the data is strictly necessary to um, transmit a communication over the um, communication, uh, electronic communication network. Then um, there's no data protection if there's no uh, data security. In, uh, in the European Union, and this is an impact at national level with transposition uh, in terms of national legislation, we have uh, uh, the um, NIST directive, uh, uh, which has been repealed by the NIST directive too at the beginning of, of this year, and it concerns the um, security of network, the, the information um, the protection, uh, this, the security of, of the networks uh, and the information uh, um, on, on those networks and the Cyber uh, Security Act as well. Um, in uh, combination with some soft law, which are guidance and recommendations uh, developed by, as I mentioned before, the European Supervisory, Supervisory Authority, which is uh, the EDPB, or the National Supervisory Authorities at the member state level, or um, the European Union Agency for uh, um, Network uh, and Information Security. Then um, also in matter of data protection is really important to um, recall some other pieces of legislation which have a neighboring role um, in connection with the processing of personal data, such as employment law, because we may, may have the case of vehicle fleets managed by employers, which provide the vehicles as benefits or as a, an instrument to their uh, employees, or the spec sector specific uh, law. Uh, such as the cooperative intelligent transport system I mentioned before, or the vehicle general safety regulation, uh, which is uh, um, applicable as uh, um, the, the, the legislative framework uh, for any type uh, of, uh, of um of those uh, new CA visa vehicle uh, placed on the market because it provides the own type approval requirement for safety and uh, security purpose uh, um, that must be complied with when um, the vehicles are manufactured and then commercialized. And for all road vehicles spanning from cars, vans, uh, trucks, and uh, buses, uh, um, the requirements uh, um, are um, focusing on uh, intelligent speed uh, system systems, uh, reversing detections with camera sensors. And for cars and vans only, um, it is mandatory to uh, introduce uh, uh, systems that allow uh, lane keeping or uh, uh, automated braking. Mm, then there's a equal in vehicle system regulation, which uh, um, require the trigger of a signal to emergency call center in case of a serious accident. There's no tracking during the use of the vehicle, but that signal and then the processing of data um, informing on the location and the exact position of the vehicle is only permitted when there's the, the accident. As regards the Vienna Convention already mentioned that now um, level three autonomous uh, vehicles are allowed in the context of this convention which has been uh, signed by all the EU uh, member states except Spain. And um, now uh, the legislation, national legislation, will have to uh, pass the rules uh, to allow those level three autonomous vehicles uh, um, to circulate in streets, in roads, where the lane uh, is closed to pedestrians and cyclists, uh, the roadway 
um, is uh, uh, designed to be separated between two directions of traffic and uh, uh, the speed of, of the vehicles cannot uh, uh, exceed uh, um, 130 kilometers per hour. Then, as I said, there are um, mobility data spaces uh, coming up, and this is allowed thanks to a new piece of legislation like uh, the Data Act, the Data Governance Act. This is just an illustration, a picture of how data can be uh, collected by uh, a, a, a smart car, a, a connected uh, as well as autonomous car. And um, um, the collection and processing of data uh, follow a specific life cycle. We need to consider that uh, the type of data can, that can be uh, used by this vehicle uh, may range from the bi biograph uh, biographic data of the uh, user of the vehicle or the owner when it, it, the, the user and owner coincide, uh, biometric data that can be used to unlock or to lock uh, the vehicle, location data when GPS uh, applications are in use, uh, uh, special categories and judicial data in connection with the use of the vehicle. Special categories can be religious uh, uh, data if uh, the vehicle is directed to a church or a mosque, is, as well as judicial data can be related to infraction of the road code. And then there are also the preferences and the habits uh, related to the driving, so some sort of uh, um, telemetry data, like technical data that combine with the vehicle identification number, which has been considered by the Court of Justice of the European Union and a, data, a personal data per se can offer a broad picture of the uh, of a specific individual. And uh, in the collection and processing role, the, 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 the data subject um, affected by um, those operations can be, of course, uh, the driver of the vehicle, the owner of the vehicle, all passengers, which can be related or not to the driver or the owner, and other drivers that we consider all the cameras that are equipped uh, within the vehicle um, that can be uh, in interacting with the vehicle itself and pedestrians. Then also privacy no, roles. No, you will have two minutes left. Yeah, privacy rules are very important uh, in the um, in the management of data protection and privacy issues because depending on the type of a company involved in collection and processing of data, which can be manufacturer, infotainment service providers, which are the providers uh, supplying services in terms of entertainment information um, applications, applications to the to the drivers insurances the type of obligations and responsibilities may uh, change and uh, those data controllers or joint controllers and processors for instance a, a category of data processor can be the equipment manufacturers like the software providers um, of the applications installed on the vehicle will have to choose a legal basis to collect and process personal data and usually consent um, for um, an, a number of type of uh, data, such as uh, um, location data, special categories of data, uh, should be uh, the preferred legal basis. But also other uh, other uh, um, other legal basis could be applicable depending on the circumstances, such as the necessity to perform a contract, the legitimate interest of the data controller, or the necessity to comply with the legal obligation. Of course, there are data protection concerns uh, in relation to those privacy rules, to the way in which uh, consent is collected and uh, uh, is managed uh, on the part of the data controllers, or how the data controllers can manage the third party uh, value chain uh, in the uh, provision of the um, of, of all the parts that collect uh, and process data and security concern 
uh, are not only related to the la to to the possibility of hacking uh, leading to the loss uh, of uh, confidentiality integrity and possible availability of data but also on the control of uh, the access to the different systems uh, processing uh, the data to the way in which uh, security measures such as encryption um, are ma and managed and the way in which for instance encryption keys are uh, stored and protected. There are a series of compliance aspects that can help mitigate those risks from applying the privacy principles in all the process of the design of the collection and processing of personal data, uh, selecting uh, the um, grounds, uh, the legal basis, the grounds for processing, uh, providing uh, the authorization and instruction to the person uh, working within uh, um, the data control and data processor uh, organizations and manage the third party relationships between data controllers and data processor. Of course, the data subject rights will have to be respected. And in general, data pro uh, protection impact assessment will be mandatory as well as the appointment of a DPO. Uh, I've arrived at the uh, use case, but I guess that, I'm, uh, that I've run out of time. Uh, my um, takeaway message is that uh, uh, there's a greater technology complexity revolving Involving around uh, uh, data protection in smart cars, and, and there's a need be, to be there's a need for a balance between uh, uh, data protection and uh, the technology advance. The prolification of the uh, legislation um, demands for a clear attribution of uh, roles, uh, responsibility, liabilities within the value chain uh, of uh, smart cars. And uh, it is necessary to uh, make all the players, all the stakeholders in the value chain accountable uh, as, as long as uh, this domain is evolving. Uh, putting at the center and at foremost importance the data, giving its centrality, especially personal data, um, developing so among all the stakeholders, uh, common practices uh, and uh, um, use cases for data protection objectives. I'm sorry if I was, uh, uh, if I was late, uh, I'm available for all questions. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina, for your presentations. We already have the um, data protection and privacy in the perspective of EU and Italy. So we will have the um, fourth panelist, Pedro Duarte Batista, LLM. Pedro Duarte Batista is an alumnus of CCLS Queen Mary University of London with an LLM in Computer and Communications Law graduating in 2013. Pedro holds a law degree and a master's degree at the Catholic University of Porto. Pedro is a qualified lawyer and currently works at a Portuguese law firm, PDA. Pedro is specialized in corporate and M&A matters. He has been involved in several transactions, mainly focused on the acquisitions and sale of companies, corporate restructuring plans, as well as corporate assistance for to several companies. Recently, um, Pedro have been selected by his colleague to be included in the best lawyers for Portugal list for 2024 in corporate law. Pedro will discuss about AI, liability, and autonomous car. This is a very interesting topic. And Pedro, please have your time to present. Hello. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much for the organizers of this to have invited me, especially my longtime friend Firdausi, who was was always a pleasure to work with. Um, I I would like to 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 start by saying something about myself is that I'm speaking about technology without knowing much about technology, so I really don't know how how the hell I can project my presentation here. <laughs> where where shall I shall I press to do it? See if anyone. Hey, yeah, can. Uh, you can click the share screen, the green the green button. Can you find okay. it? Okay. Yeah, I think I I think I've managed to get there. Yes, so we can see it now. Okay. Yep. This one, this one. Okay. You are you are seeing it right now. 
Yes, yes. We can see it very clearly. Okay, okay. So, uh, basically, my my title of my presentation is about smart cars driving to the future, meaning that one of the issues when you, when we discuss technology and law is that techno technology usually moves faster than law than law meaning that especially in portugal for it for instance every time we try to regulate something re related to technology you we, we usually arrive late meaning that as soon as we regulate something <clears throat> there's already a different technology and the current and the one being being regulated is no longer used uh this lies on the first concept and and the way we what is deemed to be as in artificial intelligence, which is a concept that most of people use nowadays and somehow related <clears throat> to a, to a, to a, to a different definition of machine learning, uh, and sometimes they they tend to be the same, or people tend to confuse them or to use them regardless of the, of, 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 the, of the nature of the expression. Um, if, 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 we, if we think a bit about it, we can, we can see that, uh, for, for instance, the Cambridge Dictionary used it to define artificial intelligence as the use of computer programs that have some of the qualities of human mind, such as the ability to understand language, recognize speakers, pictures and learn from experience. If you see here, this definition of artificial intelligence already included the concept of machine learning is that meaning that a machine that learns by itself without any human intervention uh, the, acad the academia for instance universities and came uh, some time ago with a with a definition stating that the artificial intelligence is design of intelligent agents that are capable of adapting to and learning from various situations and achieving complex goals uh, Although these definitions may seem the same, they are slightly different. And it's, it leads us to the first issue regarding artificial intelligence from a legal perspective, is the necessity that we have of having the notion of the artificial intelligence to be clearly defined and closely aligned with the work of international organizations working on this concept to ensure that when we go to the legal to the legal frameworks we have a very defined concept easy for everyone being applied for everyone which is easy to regulate and which it, and, and easy to to use uh, there has been a proposed regulation for artificial intelligence on, on, on the European Union within the European Union recently, which will try to define what the proposed definition would be. The AE system means a machine-based system that is designed to operate with varying levels of autonomy and that can, for explicit or implicit objectives, generate outputs, outputs such as predictions, recommendations or decisions that influence physical or virtual environment. This has not been adopted, adopted within the European Union yet, nor, of course, in Portugal, we don't have any definition of, uh, of artificial intelligence, at least a concrete one and defined one. Uh, with regards to, to, to smart cars, and before entering that, uh, we should think why we, knew that, why we need or I will, why, we, why we must have smart cars in the future. It's been studied that 90% of the accidents nowadays occur due to human-related error. I mean, most of the accidents are caused by humans. 80%, uh, there would be an 80% reduction of, of these accidents with introduction of autonomy. And at least a reduction of 40% in the parasite tra traffic looking for, par looking for parking. So these are the great uh, issues with mobility nowadays. And what business intelligence can, can assist us is to get a mobility that is connected, that is autonomous, that is mostly electric, 
I don't I won't I won't focus on this because uh, it's it's energy and I'm I'm not uh, capable of, of speaking about it and it's also shared meaning that the these different uh, solutions will of course uh, need to be shared by different individuals in order to achieve all these all these goals. Um, I would like to start with the definition of <laughs> smart cars and autonomous vehicles, but I think Valentina in, his, in, in, she, in her previous presentation already gone through the, the, this uh, these definition and the, var and the various levels of autonomy that, may ha that, that we have. I, I confirm that here in Portugal we, st we are stuck in, in, in level two in the autonomy. Uh, we have we have not been capable of of changing our our regulations in order to accept more autonomous vehicles and meaning that we are still stuck in in those vehicles that are smart because they are techno they have technological features but they are not in any way autonomous meaning that there is always a necessity of having some human contact with when driving the cars or when, when inside the cars. Being full, imagine if you have Tesla, you will always need to put your hands on the wheel during a specific time, otherwise the car will stop and you will not get you will not get to to the to the to the destiny. So I won't focus too much on these for, for, for the sake of time and, and when at, at, at this stage, but my my goal here and my my understanding is that we'll still need to have a clear definition of what a smart car of autonomous vehicle would be under the, under the European Union and the under the Portuguese law. Um, of course, we need also to consider consider other the issues specifically regarding regarding to the to the liability. That the more autonomous the cars will be the more issues we will create. So I, I will just move on this because Valentina covered these slides uh, a few minutes ago and she spoke about this better than I would. So I'm happy with what she said. Uh, with regards to liability concern, if we go to a fully autonomous car, we will need to think about if there is a car accident, how can we decide who is at fault? Is the producer of the car? Is the, the software programmer? It will be the supplier, the user owner, or the machine itself. Because as the machine has machine learning features, we will be liable for the car accident. Uh, under the Portuguese legislation, one of the reasons why we we don't want we don't accept to have autonomous cars is falls inside this definition of autonomy because what the portuguese law understands at this stage is that we need humans to be always the the the, the, the person liable for the smart for the car accident because our insurance law is is designed as as that i mean meaning that a, a, a car is driven by a person who has the control over the vehicle so if anything happens without prejudice to any rights to to cover the damages that we may have against the the producer is always it a car accident is always solved, solved between insurance companies not of, not of the car but of the drivers is the driver who contracts the, the insurance policy, at least in the Portuguese legislation. Um, we what we what we'll need to to to, to think when we when we when we dis define li these liabilities concerns in in the, in the in the in this industry is we always want to avoid under uh, uh, events that are not relevant or that we don't want to happen, uh, we will need to have a high investment in safety and 
better roads, everything that can make the cars being autonomous, they can behave in, in, in a street that is safe, which is not, uh, uh, does not have any features, and ex post the compensation for any damages. This lies to what I really think will be the biggest role in the future regards to this, which we, we will always end up in insurance. At least, because we all, I mean, most of us have studied law in several countries or in several jurisdictions. We have always come across with the difficulties of finding this, of defining civil, civil liability, which is what is damage, uh, what, what is fault, uh, what is the, the casualty of the event, we all always end up uh, getting stuck when we try to define civil liability. On top of that, when we go to autonomous vehicles, we always will always end up in the, in the situation that I mentioned below, be, be, before, which is we, don't, we will not know if the, if the software developer will be at fault if, it's, if it was a producer mistake, who will be at fault? So what we will need to have, or at least what, we'll, what we look at, it would be to have insurance policies that clearly define how and, and who is at the fault depending on the several car accidents that may, have, that may arise. And uh, one, one of the things that that's been discussed within the insurance companies in Portugal, I spoke with, with, with one of them recently, is that the, the, insure, the insurers will probably, at, at least at the beginning of use of the autonomous car, ask for higher premiums for the insurance. I don't know all the countries in, in, in Europe, of course, nor, in the, nor within the world, but at least in Portugal, the civil liability of the, the, the insurance policy for cars, for vehicles is mandatory, meaning that any car in Portugal or any driver in Portugal may, needs to have a, an insurance associated to it, which at least covers all the damages causes, caused by the car, by the vehicle to any third party. So this issue needs or will be covered by, by, by insurance because as you understand, ins an insurance policy covers uncertainty. Okay, the, the liability is decided and with the, under the, the, the insurance policies, we, which are the same for everyone. The insurance, pol the insurance company will pay the damages, will get reimbursed for, by, by, by the driver. The, the costs are distributed amongst all the person the, the the persons in, in, involved and we take another thing we have a prompt compensation to the driver if anything happens and if anything goes to the court the the the, the, the person who suffered the cost will be compensated because as you want as, as you all know when you have an insurance policy the premium the the the, 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 the price is paid and then you cover and then you cover the, the obligation after that. Um, I, 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 I entered here uh, a disadvantage of, of, of refusal to insure, not in Portugal, because in Portugal you cannot refuse to insure. As from the moment that autonomous cars are introduced in Portugal, the insurance companies will need to adapt. The, the law on insurance will need to be amended so that we have a, a, a mandatory insurance for, for smart cars that don't that that, that don't happen. Um, the lack of relevant data data that may create difficulties in assessing risks at the moment. So we don't we still don't know how the smart cars behave, how the autonomous vehicles will behave, and how the machine learning will will impact development and so we still do not have all the information to to define to clearly define adequate insurance po insurance policies but i think that is something that will be managed as soon as the as the studies are 
are are fact, and the about Jaeger premiums I have already I have already talked about. Um, I, oh, I'm, I'm think I think I'm running out of time, but just a conclusion. I I, I have other key aspect aspects that that I would like not to address, but to think to to ever think about, and is that how will we regulate or how will we how will we manage the existence in the future of both fully autonomous cars and n not at all autonomous cars in the future because one of one of the advantages of the autonomous cars and as valentina mentioned in in, in, the, in the slide is that the way they will be connected somehow so every time if and if they are connected in a you know in a very decent system and Every time a car move, makes a specific move, the other car, which is nearby, we all, will automatically know the move that the other car is making. So it can just adapt. If we have in the same road a fully autonomous car and a not at all autonomous car managed by a human, the, we will need to guarantee that autonomous car fully adapts to any unpredictable and undesirable moves by the by the driven car. That's one of the issues that we we, we, we still need to consider. And we will of course need to guarantee that the CE marks on on parts of vehicles on and autonomous cars. Uh, if we go to the autonomous cars, we will have a lot of brands moving, entering the market. And as we all know, a, a, a brand like a Mercedes or a BMW or or a, or a Ferrari, they always have like a, sta a, a statement of quality associated to the brand. And we we will have a lot of new brand of cars entering the market and we will need to, to guarantee that we have adequate regulation and legislation to prevent just uh, just random brands to enter the market without without any quality of products. You have and one minute left. I, I need 30 seconds. <laughs> and then the last issue, <laughs> and I lead the last issue, I, as I think Valentina addressed this about about uh, about privacy, but there is another thing that worries me, which is the consequence of the world we are living in. Every every move that we make nowadays is being recorded. Every research we do on a mobile phone, every payment that we make with a with a with a, a bank card, anywhere is re is recorded. So everyone knows where I am, when I am. With a car, with a smart car, with autonomous car, this will be completely true, and we will always be trackable. I, it's 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 been it's been said or it's been predicted that by twenty by twenty thirty, uh, twenty thirty. I mean, within seven years, a, a considerable amount of the population will have an autonomous car, meaning that everyone everywhere is going to be controlled uh, and that's one of of course one issue that it's already happening but that still worries a, a bit uh, so thank you all uh, if any questions that i can ask i can answer i will be here Thank you, Pedro, for sharing your knowledge with us. The AI has a broad spectrum which we could apply, including in the smart cars. Well, we have received the insights of liability in autonomous car, which creates more questions in mind as part of the consequences of smart cars. Okay, so we will have the last panelist, Nicole Ren Kunha, LLM. Nicole Kunha is an alumnus of CCLS Queen Mary University of London with an LLM in Banking and Finance, graduating in 2013. Nicole is a partner, head of legal affiliations of a Brazilian boutique law firm, Bash and Rameh at Fogados, specialized in international asset finance transactions. Over the last 15 years, Nicole has been handling international affiliation finance transactions, providing the legal support to finance institutions among different countries, investors in aviation Brazilian market. Between 2000 and 2008, 
Nicole worked in the legal department of the Brazilian airline, Fardic Logistica. Nicole has a postgraduate in business law with specialization in tax and an LLM in technology and innovation law. Both concluded at Fundação Getulio Vargas Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Some awards include most admired women lawyers from economic sector in aviation and regulation in 2023 in Brazil. WWL as thought leaders, aviation transport, national leader, aviation transport lawyer in 2022 and 2023. The topic presented by Ms. Nicole is about the flying cars from aviation law. I believe this is one of the first webinars talking about flying cars in legal perspective. Ms. Nicole, please kindly share us your insights and knowledge in these sessions. The time is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you the, for the introduction. Uh, can you hear well? Uh, yes. Correctly. Okay. Great, great. So first, I'd like to thank you for this invitation. Um, I hope I can attend the expectations to discuss a little bit in relation of the uh, regulation that is being developed for um, flying cars or uh, EVTOLs uh, in Brazil and uh, to be in the same level of my colleagues here. <clears throat> Let me share my screen here. Uh, with you. Is that okay? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so uh, we are going to talk here about EVTOLs or uh, flying cars. There are people that call it like uh, uh, electric helicopters, uh, many ways of uh, referring to EVTOLs. And um, uh, I'm a Brazilian lawyer, but uh, many of the aspects that I will cover here uh, is related to many other jurisdictions, not only to, to Brazil. So uh, you don't feel boring when you see the beginning that is just Brazil. No, it will not. We, we will see that it refers to apply to generally other jurisdictions. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So let's go for definitions first. So if it does are electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. So no doubt we are talking about aircraft. No doubt we need an aviation uh, civil authority to regulate those transports. Yeah. Different from what has been uh, said in the previous presentations about smart cars. Uh, here we are talking about really a different type of aircraft. We are talking about a different paradigm that had not, has never been uh, tested before in the market. It's a different type of transportation inside the concept of aircraft. I took here a definition of aircraft. Uh, which is considerable any device that is maneuverable in flight that can support itself and circulate in airspace through aerodynamic reactions capable of transporting people and things. This is a definition from the Brazilian Aeronautical Code, but much similar that it has been uh, used in other countries as well. And I'd like to call the attention for uh, another concept that was also mentioned in previous presentations that also related to EVTOLs, which is autonomous operation. Because when we refer to autonomous operation, we are really referring to uh, an operation in the aspect of an EVTOL that you do not have a remoted pilot or a pilot in the aircraft. You have a total autonomous operation over the aircraft. There is no pilot that can have the control of such aircraft when it's being operated. And uh, what we have seen now among the regulators worldwide and preparation of the market initially for the EVTOLs is to have the first step of EVTOLs with a pilot on board. After a few years, then they are gonna test remoted pilot aircraft 
with a pilot not on board and then develop the market and the necessary regulations and the airspace to go to a different level, which is the autonomous operation. So I bring, I bought here, uh, I, I had, I, I included here a definition from the Chicago Convention in Article 8 that deals with this concept of autonomous aircraft and the, the specific requirements and authorization that the authorities needed to be in charge for such type of flights. And when we talk about the Chicago Convention, uh, we need to take in mind that we have 193 countries that signed this convention. So this is not only applicable to Brazil, applicable to Brazil but other countries as well. So when we uh, deal with this scenario, this ecosystem of EVTOLs, we have different authorities involved. So we have uh, the National Civil Aviation Agency in Brazil. Uh, and I included here other aviation authorities because when we talk about regulation of the airspace, this is not isolated for one country. This includes uh, a cooperation of work among all the aviation authorities, because when we uh, think about manufacturing aircraft, you're not manufacturing only to that country. You want to achieve the whole market, the globalized market. So all authorities must cooperate. Is a cooperation work to regulate the, to regulate this market. So we also have the traffic control department that takes control of the airspace. In case of Brazil, is the DSEA, which is connected to the Ministry of Defense. We have the Brazilian National Agency of Telecommunications, because when we talk about those types of uh, aircraft, to talk about this um, data of transfer data and communications uh, among aircraft is in the air. Uh, and we will need to have uh, federal, state, and municipal authorities involved because many infrastructure will be necessary to achieve the goal of um, the market and operation of EVTOLs. So investments and infrastructure will be necessary. Uh, and also we have one important sector here uh, for these um, market to happen, which is the power energy sector, because we're gonna talk, we, you will see uh, in the next slides that uh, if it also, we will need vertical ports to be constructed in urban areas. And uh, energy is a very important thing, uh, is an important thing for uh, the operation of certain vertical ports. So in terms of legislation and certification, uh, aviation is a topic that's regulated worldwide. So we need to have a regulation over it, yeah, for the safety of the pe for, of people worldwide. So in case of Brazil, we have the MAN uh, legislation, which is the Brazilian Aeronautical Code, uh, where the Brazilian uh, National Civil Aviation will have as a standard to establish the regulations necessary for EVITALs, general Brazilian civil and criminal laws for air operations uh, to establish civil and criminal liabilities, which are also applicable worldwide when we talk about aviation, uh, of course, for civil and criminal laws in relation to each country. Uh, the resolutions, as I previously mentioned, that uh, we need to be developed to first uh, establish the certification of project of such evitals. Then how the, will be the regulations over maintenance, operation, uh, pilot certificates and insurance requirements. Uh, air traffic control department and telecommunications, for example, for the regulations of what kind of transponders will be necessary for such aircraft to be operating together. Because we are not talking only about evitals, we are talking about uh, a shared airspace between EVTOLs, helicopters, commercial aircraft, drones, remote pilot aircraft. So that is not the future. That is already uh, what we need to think for now. Environmental legislation, uh, EVTOLs has a very big flag on this because uh, we are talking about reducing all uh, fossil fuel. Uh, and federal, state, and municipality legislation, because 
Uh, when we think about evitals, we think about vertiports to be located in different places in urban area. Uh, for example, to achieve uh, places where helicopters cannot achieve due to noise restrictions, for example. So evitals will not have this problem in, related, in relation to noise. And uh, so we needed to think about these and the, the licenses that will be necessary for constructions and infrastructure. So one thing I would like to call the attention and uh, some of my colleagues in previous presentation also introduced this is the advanced air mobility ecosystem, which is a concept that also include the urban air mobility concept and it engage a lot of different sectors. So we have new players in the market, the market which are the manufacturers of Evitols and also uh, existing players as well. We talk about Airbus, we talk about Boeing, we talk about Embraer in Brazil, which are big companies that already have also specific companies developing and working on the certification of the projects of Evitols uh, for now. Uh, there will be maintenance providers that will be working together, aviation agencies involved, airport authorities, air traffic authorities, uh, state energy sector, infrastructure, and it's a multimodal transportation because the idea here of an EVTOL is to cover short distances and to be a multimodal transportation. Uh, the idea is not to get people as passengers to go to an airport and get a flight. Of course, maybe there will be a vertical port in the airport, but the idea here is to establish uh, small vertical ports in metro station, commercial centers, so consumers can have access to it, uh, to go to, through short distances that Nowadays, some of them are covered by helicopters, but helicopters are transport that are accessible to just to a few group of consumers. So we are referring here to a democratization and with a low cost of the transport. So we integrate different players. We will need to have new platforms to be uh, developed for the boarding of such as passengers in these specific vertiports, uh, 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 vertiports dealing with the safety of them, not only safety on board, but the safety of them when they are uh, embarking, uh, doing the embarkment on such uh, uh, helicopter and such uh, evitals. We are talking about uh, artificial intelligence. We are talking about uh, 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 a working group of private and public investments that will be necessary, not only a uh, private sector, but the public sector due to the uh, energy uh, investments, among others. So one important thing here is that uh, we need to, to think about a different type of controlling uh, and supervising of such uh, EVTOLs, which are not only about radio frequency or having an air traffic uh, controller in a station as uh, we have seen, but we are talking about the introduction and use of 5G technology also to be uh, combined to the operation of those transports. So we have a few challenges uh, that we need to deal. And the one is time and cost for certification projects and operation certificate. We are talking about a high investment uh, of developing and manufacture EVTOLs. And sometimes uh, new manufacturers, startups may underestimate the costs involved on it with specific knowledge and technology requirements. We have seen in the last few years, some players that were taken out of the market because uh, it's a really time and investment and are working together uh, like uh, I think we need to see, and we have seen public consultations because the private sector needed to work together with the public sector uh, to establish the regulations. Yeah. Uh, last October, the Brazilian Aeronautical uh, AJ's, uh, Aviation Agents signed a cooperation agreement with the FAA in the United States for the certification of EVTOLs. And we are going to we are going to see more of such cooperations, uh, certifications um, uh, worldwide to establish these uh, types of transport. 
uh, as I said, cooperation of uh, previously said private and public investors uh, will be necessary uh, for zoning licenses in the city, uh, a high investment in, in electric powers, as previously said, and we needed to break a paradigm here. This is a challenge about consumers thinking how this is safe. First, we are talking about aircraft, which is the most safe transport that we have in the world, one of them. And uh, this was going to be uh, developed in the middle of regulators uh, that have been dealing with this worldwide, and they will not leave safety aside. So this is something very important. So that's why I said we have steps here. So first of all, those CVTOLs have, have been developed uh, with a pilot on board. And once we can have uh, the necessary safety insurance and regulations and interaction of the airspace with the all other players uh, and all other operators in the airspace, this may, will develop for a remote pilot aircraft. And then finally, to autonomous uh, aircraft, totally autonomous one. So finally, the, my last topic uh, are also, we saw the challenges, but the future benefits. So we're talking about a different transport and alternative transport for short and distance facilitating urban air mobility with a lower cost of infrastructure. Of course, we talk about the high cost first, but I mean, if we compare adapting and uh, construction of new highways or new tube stations. Uh, these in terms of infrastructure are much less cost than uh, when you talk about uh, constructing highways. There are uh, cities that we do not have space to do that anymore. Yeah, so this is a, a, an alternative trust, transport for short distance. And uh, this will be a democratization for a new group of consumers because uh, there is a very, uh, uh, there is a reduction in the costs of operation of such EVTOLs compared to the helicopters that we have nowadays in 80%. So the idea here is that consumers will be able to pay for and afford this type of transport for short distances. And the, there will be the integration of metropolis, as I said, vertiport is uh, installed in metro stations and, uh, I'm sorry, and, and other uh, locations. So we have a sustainable, sustainable environment as well. This is, a, as I said, a big flag. We have less noise, we have less pollutant because we're talking about here, uh, here about zero emission of fossil fuel as an alternative. Uh, by the use of different technologies. So we have seen Evitos uh, manufacture projects in different ways. Uh, this is, was uh, also mentioned uh, for, by my colleague in a previous presentation by Fidalsi uh, in relation to the different technologies. It's not only batteries, but you also have technologies uh, in relation to uh, propellers and hydrogen fuel combined with oxygen. So different technologies have been tested uh, in this uh, since. Uh, so finally, uh, we have also, we need to think about a growth in tax collection because it's a different activity, new players. So return for the government, we expect for return for the people in the, in the cities. Uh, as I said, the idea is one day to achieve the total autonomous operation of Evitals. And uh, last, uh, for final, uh, we have seen one publication of ANAC in Brazil from last August saying that this market is estimated in $1 trillion for 2040. Uh, yes, so here is my contact. So if anyone would like to send messages after this presentation or keep in contact, I'm really happy to discuss this matter and uh, to exchange ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicole, for your presentation about the EVTOLs in Brazil. It is indeed an interesting topic. We are not done yet with the electric cars, but we are foreseeing the EV tolls or flying cars in the future. As we already had 
uh, five panelists sharing their perspectives. I must say this discussion today is really vibrant and rich of no new knowledge of smart cars coming from the electric cars, environmental, and then the EV talk itself. Well, we are heading to the first, uh, to the second Q&A sessions and everyone who have gathered up some questions for Valentina, Pedro, and Nicole. We already um, allocate three questions first, but um, due to the time restrictions, we will um, provide the contact if the participants would like to ask more towards the uh, panelists. Well, the first question, is there anyone would like to raise a question or raise a hand, please? Um, we are dedicating this opportunity for anyone who would like to ask the questions. Otherwise, I will have one uh, for each speaker and we will ask about it. Okay, it seems um, there is no questions from the participants, but uh, we are still waiting for it. So please, if you have any, just write it uh, in the chat box and then we will address your questions. Well, I will ask the questions for Ms. Valentina. Okay. As you mentioned regarding the challenges in data breach, uh, would you please share with us how does the event handling in the event there is hacking and even massive bugs in the smart cars? What do you think about that? Is there anything uh, that would you like to propose or give solutions about that? under your perspective, please. Yeah, thank you. Well, the, the cybersecurity, the, the information security aspects uh, are also very much regulated under the EU law and uh, consequently in my jurisdiction too. Um, as I just briefly mentioned before, there are a series of uh, um, legislative tasks like uh, the um, NIS 2 directive, the NIS directive, or the Cybersecurity Act. Uh, the first one provides for um, a series of uh, um, security measures uh, that are uh, imposed on uh, different types uh, um, of organizations. Uh, that are classified uh, as uh, essential or important organization from uh, a data security uh, perspective. And in this case, uh, when I refer to data, I would encompass both personal and non-personal data because this uh, le legislation also cover um, trade secrets uh, or other type uh, of uh, non-referable uh, um, uh, uh, personal data. And um, in this case, uh, to avoid uh, data breaches, of course, uh, uh, state-of-the-art uh, security measures spanning from uh, encryption uh, to um, uh, strategies like uh, processing most sensitive data uh, in vehicles, so at local level instead of outside uh, uh, on the part of the uh, data controllers uh, uh, can be uh, manufacturers uh, or uh, um, info uh, infotainment uh, providers uh, uh, servers uh, could be good strategies uh, as regards uh, possible bugs on software which are embedded in smart cars of course uh, uh, strategies and methodologies for uh, software development um, should be uh, necessarily adopted uh, under the NSI's uh, to directive, there also are uh, mandatory provisions for bug fixings uh, of uh, um, of those uh, um, applications uh, used by the essential and important entities. What is relevant uh, for mobility is that uh, organizations uh, um, dealing. Uh, and uh, operating uh, in the transport uh, sector are 
to be considered essential, providing essential services, whereas uh, uh, organizations uh, falling within the category of uh, uh, manufacture uh, of vehicles uh, and uh, and they part uh, are to consider uh, important uh, uh, um, services, important organizations. There also are rules in terms of uh, uh, incident, security incident, cybersecurity incident uh, reporting um, with the cooperation among uh, um, authorities at national levels uh, in all the EU member states. In Italy, we have uh, the Agency on Cyber of national cyber security, uh, which will work as a point of contact uh, and the support for all this type of incident. And um, uh, of course, yeah, and, and, and so the, the, there is a specific legal frameworks uh, uh, which help uh, and should help organization to address all the security risks at the network and um, information uh, security level. Okay, thank you, Valentina. It is a very interesting to mention that uh, a lot of practice and measures uh, to be taken for the data breach and the hacking or even the massive bugs in the smart cars. It is a very long way as well for Indonesia, I think, because all of the organizations and all of the policy that previously you mentioned, Valentina, it is um, it is very in a early point in Indonesia and we can see the difference from now. Thank you very much for your uh, and answering the questions. Thank you so, very much. I need to disconnect. So I'm very sorry for the work appointment uh, and uh, thank you yeah. all and uh, bye. Okay, thank you so much for participating, Valentina. Bye. So, okay. but, Grazie but, mille, Valentina. Ciao. So um, following about the incidents or the data breach or anything unfortunate circumstance circumstance in smart cars. Um, I would like to ask question to Pedro Duarte Batista regarding the liability. Well, considering the liability lies for the uh, unfortunate circumstances that I mentioned, to what extent has it been ruled under the laws to determine whose liability shall be determined? Do you think the existence of smart cars creates more disadvantages for the insurance party or even the contrary? What do you think about this, Pedro? Do you have anything in mind? I think and, and, until, until now we have uh, achieved liability insurance based on human behavior and what what the, the law try to provide is that under certain circumstances whether the car came whether whether the shock was and uh, uh, where the damages were these were criteria to define who would be at fault and we had always uh, what we have at least always here in Portugal persons who are experts in determining the the fault in a, in a car accident. I don't think that with autonomous cars the difficulty difficulties will be higher. Probably the data collect the collected for by each of the cars will help in determining uh, who is at fault or which machine was at fault and and determining whether there was a, a software issue whether there was a, a deficient part in the car so for when it, for that side it will be easier to determine to determine the liability uh, in these scenarios and the experts will all of course need to adapt and to have information or to have capacities on software analysis and so on and of course on the other but on the other hand until we reach this maturity stage of course we will need to study we will we will need um, a, a few years of work until we reach a perfection level and no no solution is perfect but the same way we have uh, 
uh, solutions being taken or being adopted or being assisted by chat gpt i think we we will end up having softwares is, and determining who is at fault based on the data collected by each of the vehicles so for this season in the in the long term it will be easier okay thank you pedro for your explanation i think uh it is another task that we need to mention about the liability regarding the smart cars especially if the company are trying to avoid the liability as much as possible Meanwhile, the insurance would like to um, have the determination which one is involved during the car accidents or even any unfortunate circumstances. So thank you so much, Pedro, for your explanation. And we are moving to the third questions to Nicole. And I have questions regarding how do you consider if the flying cars truly operated in Brazil and around the world? Do you think it provides more safety for the pilot than the regular cars, especially if it requires a different license, of course, to, be, to drive the EV dolls? Could you please explain more on it, how extent it could be improved for the safety under your perspective, Nicole, please? Thank you, thank you. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that we are talking about a, a safe kind of transport because as previously mentioned, aircraft is considered worldwide one of the most safe ways of transport. Uh, so it's different when we compare it to electric cars because we are talking about different environments. environments. Um, aviation uh, is a strong regulated sector because it works for the public sector. So this is one thing that guarantee uh, the safety of those kinds of transport. The projects uh, for the certification of this project, the, of the, the projects of EVTOLs will be strongly studied and tested before being put in practice. And uh, as I mentioned, we needed to focus on some steps here, talking about flying cars. Uh, initially, they will have a pilot, a certified pilot on board. Uh, only with the development of the technology and uh, uh, the total structure that will be necessary for the airspace uh, being uh, established with safety, we will then go to a next step of remote pilot aircraft, and then finally for the total autonomous aircraft. So I, I, I really think we are talking about a safety type of uh, transport uh, without doubt, because it's a very strong regulated sector. Okay, thank you, Nicole, for your explanation. Of course, it is a very brand new for every uh, every person in this world to have uh, flying cars for their transportation. And we will start from the EV dolls as the learning project for, for all of uh, people around the world that we can consider that flying cars is one of the other options of the smart cars. And it is very much safe because of the project and it has the certification that you mentioned and it is very well noted and thank you very much Nicole for your presentation okay thank you yeah is there any questions that coming up from other participants or the panelists regarding uh, the second session uh, the question probably is not so too sophisticated uh, but I was wondering actually if the flying cars is actually can be affordable for us, or this is more like a, a luxury car, like actually is only benefited for rich people. Like maybe this just a play play things for uh, crazy rich people, because it seems like I don't know. I think electric vehicle is more doable. Autonomous maybe is next, but flying cars, mm, yeah, I think it's still like a dream. I don't know. What do you think? I think like, especially for us who are come from developing countries. Thank you. I think we need to think about the flying cars in a concept of a collective transport, 
not an alternative of transport for a collective group and not for individuals. So they are being developed for transport of short distances like helicopters, like around five passengers per vehicle, uh, including a pilot. Yeah, this is the initial project uh, projects that have been uh, developed, not for a flying car, for a, a private person to have it and fly wherever they want. Uh, so, and the idea here is actually a democratization of this type of transport in short distances compared to helicopter, which is, a, as you said, helicopters, for example, is a, a transport that is affordable just for a small group of people. But the idea of Evitals is totally the contrary, is a democratization of this transport because it has 80% less uh, cost for operation um, and uh, for the its uh, development. So and the, so you, do, you do not have a, a fuel to to operate this aircraft, a fossil fuel. So it's uh, the idea behind it is a democratization for a big group of consumers. So we need to think about it initially in a collective kind of transport, not like a private uh, a transport. So, so yes, I think it's a, a new democratization transport in the air. Okay, thank you, Nicole, and thank you, Ferdowsi, for the questions. Do you have anything to ask Ferdowsi about the Nicole's answer about your questions, no. or is it? No, I think it's fine. It's enough. Thank you, Vinny. Okay. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah, thank you so much for Delcy. And for Nicole, it is very inspiring for me personally to learn about the EV tools that you mentioned. Uh, we can we can share our knowledge and learn to each other from this viewpoint. Thank you so much, Nicole. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for all the participants who have raised the questions. Although I believe that um, this webinar could never be enough to address all the questions that raised during and even after. But uh, we hope the materials from speakers provide us takeaways and new perspective in seeing smart cars as part of the invention that we cannot reject. Well, please allow me as the moderator of the event to convey and um, provide my closing remark. We have received in, uh, insights from Mr. Firdausi Firdaus that smart cars is mainly connected and autonomous vehicles, which comes with some key aspects to determine the smart cars. It is interesting to note that Indonesia has the largest nickel resource in the world, making Indonesia to utilize and maximize the potential to be a big player in the global automotive market, in particular in electric vehicles. However, more challenges are faced in the infrastructure, lack of engineers, restriction on foreign capital and policy readiness to tackle more related issues on uh, smart cars. Following the environmental perspective, Mahawira Singh Dillon provides the viewpoint based on environmental data that smart cars are not, are not revolutionary for saving the environment and they may even undermine uh, mass transport. Mr. Wira addressed an interesting statement that Electric cars have potential, but mass transit is always better and provided some solutions to safeguard the supply chain through the determining uh, the pressure, uh, producer responsibility with due diligence and good governance. While Ms. Valentina Torelli addressed the privacy data protection from the EU and Italy's perspective in regards to smart cars, to make us aware to make us aware that this is a crucial thing to be fully regulated, considering smart cars are collecting data and processing it for better automation. Ms. Valentina provided takeaway messages that it is necessary to provide balance and standard practices between data protection and smart mobility and clear attribution of responsibilities and liabilities. Also discussing about the liability issues, we have uh, Mr. Pedro Duarte Batista, starting with the artificial intelligence role in the making of betterment of smart cars and followed with the liability issues. To whom shall the liability be given when it comes to unfortunate circumstances? Is it the producer, AI programmer, supplier, user, or even the machine? Mr. Pedro stated that it needs a balanced market in consumer protections, 
follow up with the next question that the smart cars always need a human responsible behind it, either for automation and for determining liability for the unfortunate circumstance. We also discussed in particular the flying cars presented by Ms. Nicole Chunha. Ms. Nicole provided an overview from a Brazilian perspective on EV tolls, electronic vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. While some laws are referred to the aviation laws, Brazil already has the civil aviation resolution established by ANAC for project certification of its EV tolls. The challenges for Brazil in flying cars are similar to other, other friend, uh, countries in that it needs a huge cost and massive new manufacturers and infrastructure for the project, including the certification system. However, those will be tackled by the benefit that the new players of smart cars, especially the flying cars, uh, flying cars will develop and integrate the new system of market and transportation including increasing the country's income and environmental sustainability. It is a clear indication that we could foresee the transition from regular cars to smart cars in various types of transportation. We must admit that a lot of tasks from a legal perspective to do for now, but we will get there eventually, including the massive benefits in the advancement, development, and economic sector of a country. The main task of the policymaker and regulator in each nation is to provide a balance in the legal, economic, and environmental perspectives. We may not have stepped into the full application of smart cars yet in every country. However, we are positive to state that there are a lot of tasks and risks that we will step, uh, we will step into once each country deploys the smart cars. It is our duty to safeguard the deployment to, uh, to the protection of society's rights as the ultimate goal. Lastly, thank you all for your contribution to this discussion, making us aware that the smart cars are a new invention for every country and thus we have all of the resources here to discuss, learn and understand, receiving the opportunity to consider which one is the best for the society. Sincere gratitude is truly expressed by me as the moderator and on behalf of all of the panelists. Well, I'm handing over uh, the session to the host, Iqbal Pratama. Iqbal Pratama, uh, the time is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ayu. Uh, as she already announced that it is on, we are on the first of the whole event. On behalf of Cecilia's Queen Mary University of London from the Brazil, Indonesia, Italy chapter and distance learning program. We'd like to express our gratitude for everyone's participation and contribution to this event. We greatly hope that following this vibrant event, participants are able to learn valuable things about smart cars, whether as a consumer, business person, or law policy makers, so that the development of cars is in accordance to what human needs to improve our quality of life. Goodbye, everyone. Have a good day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay happy. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.